I saw and remember the first firework display I've ever seen uh, in my village, in the highest point of the town, and I was absolutely overcome by it. I think that I've always been interested in chemistry from really quite early times, and um, I didn't have the opportunity really to have much connection with chemistry, obviously, until I went to the grammar school, but I was very fortunate in having a, a chemistry master who was encouraging in that sense of the word. But the main factor was that my cousin who had been studying at Cambridge came to live with us as he was made a, an inspector during the war for the Ministry of uh, Supply. So um, he obviously filled in all my interesting questions and uh, even produced some of the chemicals that I wanted as well or wanted to play with. The first thing that happened when I came to the school was that um, I know I'd put on to the, uh, my curriculum vitae that I had some interest in fireworks. I said to the headmaster at the interview, um, is there any way where I can build a small firework laboratory? So he wasn't surprised, he didn't fall off his seat. He gave me a piece of land. It had a high 14 foot wall around it, quite close to where I was living. And it took me about 12 months to license it as a firework factory, a small firework factory. What we started to do was to change the whole format of how those displays took place. Most of them were on the ground, if you like, set pieces on the floor, nothing very much in the air at all, just a few rockets and a few shells. And we changed it to an all aerial type of display and very little on the ground at that time. And so basically that's how we in, in fact started something quite different and it took on really quite well. We picked up really between, I would say, 1980 and onwards, some of the major firework displays that were taking place in England, really. It was not until the next generation came along that we started into computerized displays that things changed really quite dramatically. Some of these big displays like London Eye or the Olympics and that sort of thing, changing their character and function very, very greatly. All firework colours have always been low temperature flames and therefore you're talking about what you can do with chemical reactions which are taking place at probably seven or eight hundred degrees. And so you can only do primary colours, red and green, blue and yellow. If you go to high temperature flames where you've got um, magnesium aluminium alloys or something to push the temperature right up, you can immediately get to the intermediate colours. You can get an apple green or you can get violets and mauves and if you're if you know how to do it, you can get the most beautiful orange. And there are, there are challenges in the chemistry which are purely chemical. There are, there are some things that we cannot get right, and, and the biggest problem is blue. The copper chloride molecule uh, is very easily broken up and doesn't seem to want to perform properly. Blue at a distance is tending to look white. There are no really deep blues in fireworks anymore. And that's probably because we don't use arsenic in fireworks anymore. And the old blue uh, chemical is copper acetoarsenide. I've not found a way of getting over it. In fact, it's the, it's the biggest challenge, I think, and the unsolved one.
it's nine o'clock at night, it's a warm, pleasant August evening, and uh, the wind is just right to carry the smoke over the sea, and um, you're, you've had a good meal and, and a drink and all the rest of it, and you're feeling quite pleasant. And the display it looks really nice in the, that evening, and, and you, even quite simple fireworks, which are not particularly extravagant, can be absolutely enjoyable, and you're carried away by it. There is a psychological effect in fireworks. There's no question of that.